Hi. In this short video, we will take a deep dive into the valves of an ammonia refrigeration system. In this video, we'll explore a variety of topics related to refrigeration valves. First, we'll briefly discuss the functions of refrigeration valves within a system. Then we'll see some examples of the different types of valves. In items three and four, we'll review valve operating limits and the materials that are used to manufacture them. For items five and six, we'll go over how valves are often represented in PNIDs and the related safety systems. Finally, we'll conclude by reviewing recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices for refrigeration valves. Namely, we'll highlight some unique requirements in IIAR standards two, three, four, and six. The purpose of a valve is to control the flow of fluid within a refrigeration system by stopping flow, regulating pressure, diverting flow, or preventing reverse flow. Under normal conditions, valves within a refrigeration system can contain pressurized liquid ammonia, vapor ammonia, or oil. Valves related to a refrigeration system can contain glycol, water, caustic solutions, or beverages meant for consumption. There are many types and variations of refrigeration valves, and each can have a unique purpose. Straight globe valves are common in refrigeration systems, and they are largely used for controlling the flow by allowing or stopping the flow. Typically, the flow direction through a globe valve is against the plug. Globe valves should not be used to throttle the flow of fluid. Instead, they are either fully open or fully closed and require multiple turns to operate. Angled globe valves are just as common in refrigeration systems and are used for the same purpose as straight globe valves, controlling the flow of fluid by allowing or stopping the flow. Ball valves are less common in refrigeration systems. However, they are like globe valves in that they are used to control the fluid flow by allowing or stopping the flow. Typically, they are installed so that the handle points in the direction of the hole in the ball. Ball valves should be either fully opened or fully closed and require a quarter turn to operate. The spring-loaded ball valve, or commonly called dead man valve, is a special type of ball valve. These valves are designed to be self-closing. This self-closing feature is a safety feature which requires the operator to forcefully and intentionally keep the valve opened. This protects against two distinct situations. First, this prevents an operator from mistakenly opening a valve when they intended to close the valve. Secondly, it requires conscious effort when operating the valve. If an operator ever loses consciousness while draining oil, the valve will automatically close. Butterfly valves are not typically used in refrigeration systems. However, they are frequently used to control the flow of secondary coolants, such as glycol solutions. Butterfly valves are generally designed for the fluid flow to be bi-directional. Typically, they are installed so that the handle is parallel to the disc. Like ball valves, the handle will point along the line of fluid flow. Butterfly valves are not frequently used to throttle the flow of fluid. Instead, they are either fully open or fully closed and require a quarter turn to operate. Gate valves are seldomly used in refrigeration systems, but are regularly used in water systems. These valves have a gate with a tapered profile that moves in line with the valve stem and perpendicular to the fluid flow. Gate valves can be used to throttle the fluid flow. Check valves are used to prevent fluid backflow. The check valve allows fluid to flow in one direction and not the other. These are used in refrigeration systems to isolate system components by maintaining pressure differences and preventing the equalization of pressure. There are various types of check valves in ammonia refrigeration systems. This check valve doubles as a manually controlled isolation globe valve, which is normally in the open position. These check valves can typically be found downstream of oil separators. This type of check valve functions in the same way, but cannot be used as a manual isolation valve. These check valves are frequently used where a vessel will be exposed to high and low pressures, such as liquid transfer vessels. Hand expansion valves are used to manually throttle the flow of fluid. This is accomplished with a tapered plug. As the plug is moved up, the valve opening increases in size. As the valve opening increases in size, more fluid is allowed to flow through the valve opening. 
These valves are often referred to as metering or throttling valves. Manufacturer specifications for the flow values are described in terms of turns open. The thermostatic expansion valve is a semi-automatic throttling valve that controls the flow of fluid based on an external temperature and pressure. The sensing bulb in combination with the spring are used to set the control pressure of the diaphragm. The equalization line is connected to the refrigeration system, typically at the outflow of an evaporator. The diaphragm within the valve is moved as the temperature and pressure within the evaporator change. As the diaphragm is moved, the valve is opened or closed. Solenoid valves are used to automatically control the flow of fluid within a refrigeration system by allowing or stopping the flow of fluid. Solenoid valves function similarly to globe valves in that they are not used to meter flow. They are either fully open or fully closed. A solenoid valve has two main mechanisms, the closing spring and the solenoid. The closing spring works to force the plug shut. For this reason, the valve is closed unless the solenoid is activated. The solenoid is activated by an electrical current which pushes the plunger needle down, exposing the valve to a pressure difference. This forces the piston down and allows the fluid to flow freely. The valve is closed by stopping the current, which retracts the plunger and then forces the valve closed. The valve stem at the bottom can be used to manually open or close the valve. A motorized valve is operated automatically by a control system. The valves displayed are motorized expansion valves that are used to throttle the fluid flow. In this case, a motor is used to control the valve opening. Pressure regulators are used to control the fluid flow based on inlet, outlet, or differential pressure. The valve displayed is an inlet pressure regulator that modulates in order to maintain the inlet pressure. An important detail to note is that an inlet pressure regulator cannot maintain an upstream pressure that is lower than the downstream pressure. There are many different types of pressure regulator actuators for specific applications. Strainers are used to filter the fluid of particulate contaminants. This is done in order to protect the many control valves used in a refrigeration system. Typically, these valves are located upstream of control valves. Float switches are used to provide feedback to the refrigeration system. Frequently, they are used to automatically open and close solenoid valves or de-energize compressors. Next, we will review the operating limits of valves in terms of rated pressure and temperatures and turns open of hand expansion valves. The maximum working pressure and operating temperature ranges are provided by the manufacturer in product bulletins and brochures. This valve has a maximum safe working pressure of 400 PSIG. Manufacturers also provide helpful charts and graphs which describe flow rate in terms of tons of refrigeration versus number of turns open. The same bulletins and brochures which provide the operating limits of valves also communicate the materials which were used to manufacture the valves. Different manufacturers provide different details within their bulletins and brochures. PNIDs are helpful in understanding how the refrigeration system is arranged and in communicating the type of valve in use. Typically, PNIDs are schematic in that they represent the arrangement of equipment and valves as opposed to exact representation of valves. In the images that follow, we'll show examples of various types of valves and how they are depicted on a PNID. Here is a straight globe valve, an angled globe valve, a ball valve. Here is a butterfly valve. Typically, they are used for service with an associated system and not directly with ammonia. This is a spring-loaded ball valve or dead man valve. Here are two different types of check valves. The main difference is that the check valve on the left also functions as an isolation valve. Schematically, they are identical. Here is a hand expansion valve. And here is the thermostatic expansion valve. The dotted line represents the sensing portion of the valve. This is a solenoid valve. This is a motorized valve. The motor actuator symbol is meaningless if it is not connected to the valve. This is a different motorized valve, but the symbol remains the same because it provides the same function. Here is a pressure regulator. And here is its strainer. Here is a float switch. Typically, float switches are only seen on vessels. Next, we will 
review nameplates, markings, locks, plugs, and caps as they relate to refrigeration valves. Here are different examples of valve nameplates. Some valves have adhesive nameplates and others have metal nameplates that are fastened by welds or rivets. Valve bodies are required to be marked with the manufacturer's name or symbol, direction of flow if applicable, model number, size, and range limits. IIAR Standard 3 allows for the size and range limit not to be marked due to space restrictions. Here, valve locks are used to secure valves in an open or closed position. This prevents unauthorized personnel from changing the setting of the valve without express permission. Plugs and caps are used to mechanically seal a section of pipe or valve opening shut. The picture on the left is the correct use of a plug, whereas the picture on the right requires a plug. We'll now turn our attention to the design codes and standards that must be adhered to during the design, installation, and operation of refrigeration valves. Namely, we'll consider unique requirements for refrigeration valves in IIAR's design standards that address valves, standards 2 and 3. Then we'll examine the installation requirements in standard 4. Finally, we'll address the inspection, testing, and maintenance requirements in IIAR standard 6. Let's start with IIAR Standard 2, which addresses the design of ammonia refrigeration systems. We'll examine the items listed on the screen, which are requirements in Chapters 5, 13, and 15 of Standard 2. Standard 2 first requires that provision for oil removal shall be provided, then dictates three different ways of how it can be accomplished, all of which require the use of valves. The arrangement in the picture would fulfill the second option. Here is a charging connection for a refrigeration system. Section 5.12.2 requires charging connections to be equipped with a check valve to prevent backflow of refrigerant from the system. The next two sections functionally require all equipment to have isolation valves and connection points in order to allow equipment to be tested, maintained, and isolated. The exception is for packaged systems, which are built on skids and typically have lower system charges. Next, valves that can't be accessed from the ground need to be made accessible by any of the following options, fixed platforms, portable platforms, ladders, or be chain operated. The picture is an example of chain operated valves. Valves that are used in the emergency shutdown of a system, like king valves, must be accessible from a permanent surface that can be reached while wearing emergency PPE. The controls for remote actuated valves such as a solenoid king valve, must also be accessible from a permanent surface. All equipment must have valves which allow it to be pumped out and cleared of all refrigerant for maintenance and service. Section 5.14.4 requires that valves used for the emergency shutdown of the system be labeled at the valve itself and within the PNIDs. Section 8.5.1 applies to compressors in that compressors must have isolation and maintenance valves which allow them to be pumped down. Compressors are also required to have check valves. By and large, the check valves are installed downstream of the oil separator. Although the standard previously required all equipment to be equipped with isolation valves, refrigerant pumps and compressors are pieces of equipment which require special attention. Hence, explicit requirements are given for these isolation valves. Additional requirements state what type of equipment is to have isolation valves at the inlet and outlet of the equipment. Positive displacement compressors, condensers, and pressure vessels larger than three cubic feet. The second item allows for a single set of valves to be used when isolating multiple evaporators within a refrigeration zone. Exceptions to the rule of isolation valves are shown. Here, the vessel and heat exchanger are not required to have isolation valves between them. The isolation valves installed on this equipment also allow for both pieces of equipment to be pumped down. Here, a provision for ammonia removal is typically fulfilled by quarter-inch globe valves that are installed at the strainer. Additionally, section 13.3.2 requires purge valves to be installed between check valves and automatic valves to protect against hydrostatic overpressure. This is because liquid will be trapped between the check valve and automatic valve once the automatic valve shuts off. Isolation valves need to be capable of being locked out. 
Additionally, shutoff valves, which could connect the system to atmosphere, must be either plugged, capped, blanked, or locked closed whenever they are not in use. Section 15.4.1 states that stop valves should not be installed between equipment and relief valve or between the relief valves and the piping outlet. If a valve is installed between them, the valve must be locked in the open position. If a stop valve is installed downstream of a relief valve, the pressure drop across the valve must be taken into account when designing the system. This is because relief valves are rated to relieve pressure at a certain rate and most isolation valves cause a pressure drop in the fluid. The pressure drop could prevent the relief valve from meeting that rate when activated. Lastly, if there is a stop valve between the relief valve and a piece of equipment, the equipment must have some other form of overpressure protection installed and available. Next is IIAR Standard 3, which specifically addresses the design of ammonia refrigeration valves. We'll examine the items listed. As stated in the purpose section, this publication specifically addresses valves and strainers only. The standard applies to all valves used in a closed circuit ammonia refrigeration system. It also references ASME B31.5, which is the standard for refrigeration piping and heat transfer components. Valves must incorporate a backseat feature. The backseat feature allows operators to repair valve stem packings without needing to isolate and pump down the valve. The valves, which are not required to have the backseat feature, are not commonly used in refrigeration systems for this reason. Of the allowed exceptions, ball valves are most common. The pictured valve has the direction arrow marked into the body. It is common for valves designed to allow flow in either direction to not have a direction arrow installed. Most manufacturers' product documentation is readily available online at the manufacturer's website or the vendor's website. Much of what is in Standard 3 is also included in Standard 2. The pictures provide two different examples of how the valve marking requirements can be fulfilled. This section specifically applies to shutoff valves. This section repeats everything that was in the previous slide, except that it specifically applies to control valves and strainers. Here, the control valves are automatic. Moving on, we'll dig into the requirements of Standard 4, which applies to installation. First, we have a requirement for common sense. Everything that is installed, including valves, needs to be accessible for service. Manufacturers have specific installation requirements for different types of valves, most of which specifically address fittings. Although this section specifically refers to installation, it should be clear that the plywood on these pipes would fall under the category of being forced by other distortions. In this section, the standard refers to the manufacturer's specifications three different times as it relates to installation, gasket materials, and tightening requirements for fasteners such as flanges. Where valves that are part of the closed circuit refrigeration system are open to the atmosphere, they are to be mechanically sealed by any of the listed methods. Insulation needs to be installed to allow the refrigeration valves to be serviced. This picture shows an example of an uninsulated valve group. Here is an insulated valve group where access is provided to service and operate the valve. Valves used in low temperature applications often have moisture collecting on the outside of the valve body. This section requires that condensate be prevented from dripping on the ground when the valves are not on a rooftop. Now let's turn our attention to the Inspection, Testing, and Maintenance, or ITM, requirements for refrigeration valves. These requirements are contained in Chapter 11 of IIAR Standard 6. All non-insulated valves must be visually inspected annually to identify pitting, surface damage, and paint degradation. Additionally, where applicable, valve supports must be inspected for cracks and that mounting bolts are in place. Per item H, emergency shutoff valves, such as king valves, need to be inspected annually to verify that they are labeled. For insulated valves, the insulation must be inspected to verify that the protective jacket is free of holes and punctures. Where they are visible, inspect all connections of valves. 
item L requires inspection of all openings to verify they are plugged or capped. Lastly, verify that dead man valves are installed on oil pots. Here is an example of an oil drain valve that is not equipped with a plug or cap at the end of the pipe. If visual inspections reveal excessive pitting or corrosion, non-destructive testing can be used to measure the thickness of the remaining metal. Often, the wall thickness can be measured using an ultrasonic thickness gauge, and then the data collected can be analyzed to calculate the remaining wall thickness. For pitting, a tool called a pit gauge can be used to measure the depth of a single pit. Few maintenance tasks are required for valves. However, executing the maintenance tasks is time intensive and should be spread out. Emergency valves must be exercised and lubricated annually. All other valves can be on a five year frequency. Here is an example of a valve with stem corrosion, which is an indication that the valve has not been exercised or lubricated for some time. That concludes this video on refrigeration valves. I trust you have found the information useful. We have more videos on our channel about ammonia refrigeration and process safety management. Feel free to check them out if you're interested.